Welcome everybody. Uh, let's get started straight. We have Steve Simon to talk about chain mail or the geometry of topological lattice models. Okay, thanks. Uh, first, let me thank the organization for putting together this nice conference. My first time, so this will be a lot of fun. Um, also, I should thank uh, our funding agencies, particularly uh, Science Foundation of Ireland, which has been funding my visit to Maynooth, and Maynooth has been funding my visit here. Um, um, also credit my collaborator, Fiona Patel, who did all the hard work of this project. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit of a, oh, oh, also I should say that some people in the work, in the, in the room have heard this talk three times already, or twice already at least, this is the third. Um, so I encourage them to ask all the detailed questions, and I will try to um, go slow enough so everyone else in the room will also be able to follow. Um, so ask a lot of questions. I think we have plenty of time for that also. Um, so let me start with a primer on two-dimensional, two plus one-dimensional topological quantum field theories, and then I'll back up and explain what it is we're trying to do with them. Um, so roughly, I want to think of a topological quantum field theory as a mapping from a set of world lines of particles in three-dimensional space-time manifold M to an output that depends only on the topology of the input. So you think about some three-dimensional space-time, and then here's a, a world line of particle taking path A, another world line of particle taking path B, and then from this is an input, I'm going to get an output, which we think of as our partition function. And just to sort of make contact with what we're doing in the quantum fall workshop a little bit more, you know, we sort of think about, you know, if we draw time vertically, um, we can you know, pull a particle full pair, or a few out of the vacuum, and that sort of initializes our system, and then as we know, non-abelian um, quantum ball states, there's a degenerate Hilbert space, um, but let's say we start in some state psi, some initial state psi, um, then we can bring the particles around each other in some, some arbitrary way. Um, this, that's a unitary transformation on the state psi, that's our quantum computation, then we close it back up in the end, side like this. This just gives us some number, which we'll call z. So it's, you can think of it as a, a mapping from a picture uh, of a knot to an output, whether you want to think of it this way or in terms of a partition function, uh, either one is okay. So the classic example of this is uh, chern simons theory, where you pick a gauge group and a level, the level is like the coupling constant of the interaction, and the output is given by a functional integral over the gauge field A. What you're integrating is e to the i, churn sign is action of A. You're integrating over the entire manifold. And for each uh, particle world line, you insert a Wilson loop operator, which is sort of like the path ordered uh, line integral around the line that the particle takes. And you insert one Wilson loop operator for each particle. So this rather famous connection made by Witten is if you do this, you get out a topological knot invariant of this knot. In fact, if you choose the right gauge group, um, you get the Jones polynomial, polynomial of the, the input link in the manifold. You could also um, get a, just leave out the particle world lines altogether, in which case you get a vacuum partition function invariant of the space-time manifold. Is everyone still with me? So, so yell if, if things are not clear, because it's, it's only going to get worse. Um, okay. Oh, I have in this in, in quotes here this, this equal sign. And the reason that quotes are an equal sign is because to a mathematician, this integral, this functional integral, actually is, is not a well-defined quantity. Now, you know, a mathematician will complain about any functional integral. But most functional integrals you can make well-defined by saying, okay, take a lattice, you know, discretize it in really, really, you know, small lattice integrate over every value of the field on every position of the lattice, and then try to take some continuum limit. Well, in chern simons theory, um, the field is particularly floppy <coughs> in the sense that there's no lattice small enough to, to, to have a good continuum limit. So this integral is actually really poorly defined, and that's going to be an issue we're going to come back to. So in, in fact, this whole idea of topological, topological quantum field theory, um, I'm going to talk about it in the language of chern simons theory, but it's more general you heard uh, early in this workshop, you heard 
uh, Kirill and Parsa and Yost talking about modular tensor categories, which are basically just any theory of anions where you can have an input of uh, particle world lines and an output uh, which corresponds to a partition function in a, a way that's topologically invariant. Okay, everyone still good? Okay. Okay. A couple more properties of topological quantum field theories. Particles can fuse together. We've heard a lot about fusion before, so in this picture, particles B and C come together at this point and fuse to D. Um, we have antiparticles. Particle A going up in time is the same as particle A bar going down in time. So in fact, here, this is particle D bar coming in because it's going downwards. You have the arrows the other way. Um, and it's, it's useful to define an identity particle or a vacuum particle, which is no particle at all. So you can think of A turning over here as A and A bar both coming up, because A bar is the same as A going down. A bar coming up is A coming down. And they both meet here to fuse to the vacuum particle. You can sort of think of the vacuum coming out of there. No particle. Everyone still happy? All right, so here's something that's a little bit less well known about topological quantum field theories, and this is um, what I'm going to call the omega strand. And the omega strand is a linear superposition of all possible particles weighted by a certain factor known as the quantum dimension. Um, so I'm just going to sum over, so if I draw a line and I label it with omega, I mean um, take all particle types of this line and weight them by a certain factor. Now the reason I've constructed this combination is such that an omega loop will have what's known as the killing property. So the killing property is that the, if I try to stick a particle through the omega loop, the only thing that will not give zero as a partition function is if that particle going through is the identity particle. So the omega loop will kill any non-identity particles trying to go through it. So it's projecting to the identity particle going through. And the reason for this is from unitarity of the S matrix. This is something we saw. Um, a couple times this month. Um, so the so-called modular S matrix, um, let's see if I can draw this right, is the value of this link where this guy is labeled with A and this guy is labeled with B. That's known as SAB. That turns out to be a unitary matrix. And you can see then, well in fact, uh, just to be a little bit more specific here, uh, you can break this open and up to normalization. SAB um, is this thing. Uh, maybe I should write it. Uh, let me write it this way. This thing here is SAB times uh, A, more or less. Okay, so then if I take this loop multiplied by SBC as uh, this side, SBC, since um, S is a unitary operator, you get delta AC. And in fact, this factor that I've chosen was, um, this factor I've chosen is actually the first column of the S matrix. So this factor here is in fact the first column of the S matrix. So that's why I've gotten this thing to be a projector. So you can choose, actually you can put a combination together to make a projector onto any particle just chosen it to project onto the vacuum particle. All right, so far so good. This is all just definition so far. Okay, so this thing is actually quite useful because if I try to jam two particles through an omega like this, um, the omega will kill any situation where A and B do not fuse to the vacuum. So you can, as, as we, you know, we've seen this also several times this, this, uh, this month, if I have two particles going along, a and B, <coughs> and B, I can think of a zero going between them. With an F move, I can rewrite that as A, B, C, F, with a bunch of indices here, six J symbols, and so forth. And the only thing that doesn't get killed, so then you can think of the, you know, if I'm wrapping this thing with an omega, you can think of the omega as wrapping around the middle, and then the omega projects the C to the vacuum, and since A and B are fusing, vacuum, A has to be the antiparticle of B. So in other words, if, if omega goes around two particles, those two particles have to be antiparticles of each other. Is that good? Okay. All right. 
So take this omega and you have to stick it in the back of your head because we're going to use it later. It's going to be very important for us. Um, all right. So that's the end of my primer on top of one field theories. And, and you might ask, well, why, why on earth should I care about this? Um, well, you know, the obvious reasons that, that these non-trivial topological quantum field theories probably exist, these in fractional quantum Paul effect, you know, you can build a quantum computer out of them, they're just plain interesting. Um, so, you might start asking, can we find simpler realizations of topological quantum field theories? What's the simplest one we can make in the laboratory? Of course, quantum Paul effect is the first one we found, but are there others? And that makes us start thinking about um, lattice models. Why would we want to think about this? Well. If we're telling our cold atom experimentalist friends, please construct the following Hamiltonian in your experiment, what Hamiltonian would they like us to construct? So we have to tell them what, what it is we want them to make in the laboratory. There's another reason we'd like to study topological lattice models is this issue of regularizing Chern-Simons theory. As I mentioned, Chern-Simons theory is sort of famously difficult to define precisely, and if we can put the thing on a lattice in an intelligent way, maybe we can make some progress on that. Problem. Okay, so we're not the first people to think about um, topological lattice models. There have been a number of approaches to this. So the most impressive work, I think, um, in my mind, is, is this set of models cooked up by Michael Levin and Shaogong Wen, which are really based on earlier work by Kateyev, and Kateyev's work is based on earlier work still, but um, it's based on the, the Toric code, which a lot of people are probably familiar with. So this is uh, a bit of a primer on the Levin-Wen models. I'm not going to tell you everything about the Levin-Wen models because that would be a different talk altogether. But um, roughly, they go like this. You, you take a hexagonal lattice, and um, and they're going to be, you know, each bond can take one of several different variable, di several different values. So you think of each bond as having one of several different values as a sort of standard quantum stat net type of problem. But the values are going to be labeled with the quantum numbers of a Chern-Simons theory. So for example, if, if you choose your um, you know, SU2 level 2 as your Chern-Simons theory, or you know, the Ising conformal field theory, there are three particle types, one, psi, and sigma. And so each bond is going to have one of three variables. You just label them one, psi, and sigma, and that's more or less your Hilbert space. OK, then you write down a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian has two types of terms. This is very similar to the Torah code, that there's one term that acts at the vertices and one term that acts at the plaquettes. It turns out that um, all the operators, all of these terms in the Hamiltonian, they all commute with each other, so the whole thing can be diagonalized very trivially, and, and you can just solve the problem. Uh, the vertex term is easy to describe. The uh, uh, rules of the vertex term is that you get an energy penalty unless the quantum number is coming into a vertex used to the identity. So we have three <coughs> quantum numbers coming into the vertex. You remember the fusion rules for the Ising model. What, what did we have? We had psi cross psi equals one, and psi cross sigma equals sigma, and sigma cross sigma is one plus psi. So then you just use these rules. You fuse three particles together. And if you don't get the identity, or you can't get the identity back, that gives you an energy penalty at the vertex. That's the that's a simple way to describe that, that term. The plaquette term is a little more complicated. Um, once you have all of your vertices satisfying um, the vertex term, so you're in the ground state of all the vertices, you call the, the ground state what, what, there's a name for those which are called string nets for some reason. Um, and there are many string nets that are allowed. There are many ways to satisfy all the vertex terms. The plaquette term flips the quantum numbers around, around each plaquette in such a way that if you start with a, something that doesn't violate any of the vertices, you end up with something that doesn't violate the, ver the vertices. So the ground states end up, ends up being a superposition of all admissible terms to the vertex of the, that are admissible to the vertex. So in other words, you have all these string nets that are things that don't violate the vertex terms, and the plaquette term forces them all to be a superposition in the ground state. Okay? This is very much like the Torah code, where the vertex term forces um, uh, you know, you either have one and zero on every bond, and the vertex term forces the ones to form a continuous loop, and the plaquette term um, flips around the loops in such a way that the ground state is a sum over all possible loops. Okay, so the thing that's complicated in the plaquette term is if you try to write this thing out, 
it actually turns out to be a product of six F matrices. Each F matrix has six indices, or ten indices, and you couple all these 12 bonds going around the plaquette. So, so you see you have these six bonds going around the plaquette and these six legs, and they all get coupled together. So it's a very complicated thing to write out, but you can do so. Okay. So, um, yeah? You think of these as a spin model, or you have variables on the links? Variables on the links. That's uh -huh. They're like uh, spins. Yeah, they like spins, but they take values, you know, one sigma psi, or, or they, they choose a turn Simons theory to start with, and the values one on the index, not two index, one index. Not one index, one index, one index, one index. You take choose one turn Simons theory and choose a, the. Uh, so they are on the on the links, but they're not matrices. One index, they're not matrices. They're just the name of the particle type. So one sigma psi, or if you're doing the Ising theory, you know, choose your favorite. Choose your favorite uh, Chern Simons theory. List the um, particle types, and you label the bonds with those particle types. If you ma if you imagine to engineer this uh, in a ordinary spin system, then you have to think that you kill all the other uh, ordinary linear neighbors interaction of the spin. Yeah, so How to expose this complicated interaction? <coughs> yeah, so I, I mean, How to it, it can be done. I mean, it's. I mean, as a matter of fact, if we're working with Yerji and Yost, and you know, we can do it with various quantum circuits. You can do it. It's some some complicated interaction. I mean, you might want to represent these three three spins as you know three states of a spin one object. It's a very unnatural interaction, but but you can put it together. Right out. So you have to imagine to fit the ordinary interaction to expose this to the... Yeah, it's a, it's a very unordinary interaction. Mm -hmm. But you can at least write it down. Okay. It turns out there's a, a vertex plaquette duality, which is not obvious here. I could have worked in a, in a basis where the plaquette terms were simple, but then the vertex terms would be incredibly horrible. So, yes? So uh, yeah, it, it does. There's a subtlety. The hexagonal lattice is... At, at, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter, actually. Um, for Levin and Wen chose the hexagonal lattice specifically because everything's trivalent, and there are certain s things that simplify for the trivalent case, at least for most simple chern simon series, like SU2 level K. It simplifies it. More generally, in fact, you're going to discover that, that the trivalency doesn't help you all that much um, I'm going to actually do it on a square lattice, um, but there is a, there is a subtlety that makes trivalence uh, actually a little bit simpler. Um, so so this gives you the ground state. This picture gives you the ground state of the model. Um, the quasi-particle excitations are violations of one of these two terms of the Hamiltonian. So, if, for example, if particles if the quantum numbers coming into a vertex do not fuse to the identity, they fuse to something else that costs you energy, and that must be some quasi-particle excitation. Similarly, the plaquette term can be violated, can be not in its lowest eigenstate. Okay, so here's the interesting thing. So if you solve this model and you ask what comes out of it, what you get is you get a double of the original chern simons theory. You get two copies of the original chern simons theory, one this left-handed and one this right-handed, in two plus one dimensions. And that's going to be something that we're going to try to explain a little bit clearer. Now, in some respects, it's, it's not surprising that we got a double because we didn't, um, we actually didn't break time reversal. We just took a couple of names, one sigma and psi, and put them on the bond, <coughs> but we didn't pick any sort of chirality in this model. There's nothing that's chosen a chirality, so it would have been very surprising had we gotten out something that was actually chiral. None of the terms in the Hamiltonian. The labeling of the quasi particles is uh, by you know, two times uh, particle index, or uh, yes, yes, two two copies of the particle index. And, and that's completely free, or is it restricted somehow? Uh, it's yeah, those are completely free. Two un non interacting copies. I mean, another way to say why is it that we should have two copies um, that might be a little clearer is that there's two ways to make a violation. You can violate the vertices, or you can violate the plaquettes. So it's, it's clear that you're going to have a lot of different species, and it turns out to be two copies, yeah. So what happens if, if you don't have the same coupling constant between, but if you just... The, the coefficients up here yeah. and here? So 
That's a really good question, actually. Uh, but I'm not sure if people really know for sure. I mean, I think the, the thought is that, um, okay, so the ground state will come out the same. There's no question about that. The question is, is what happens to your quasi-particle excitations when they, whether they start interacting with each other in, in, in funny ways. The thought is that, that there's at least some range of these where everything's going to be fine, but where, where, where nothing changes, that you're within the attraction basin of, of, uh, of this fixed point. But I think it, it hasn't really been studied in, in great detail. So it, almost certainly there is a, a region, of, but no one really has proved it. The ground state will certainly come out the same. I think that's, that's an obvious okay. result. Okay, so. This is just um, to convince you that if I try to uh, explain the Levin Lin model with tensor calculus, with all these 6J symbols, um, you're, everyone's life would be a nightmare. So I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to go on and try to explain it in a different way. Um, so this is, this is <coughs> how are we going to build up these topological map models in a, in a rather geometric way? Well, the way we're going to do it is we're going to, well, we're going to build up the, this lattice model sort of piece by piece, but we're going to remember that chern simons theory is really a theory of loops. It's a theory for knots. It was cooked up for knots, and we're going to try to phrase this as a lattice model built from loops. So how do we do that? Um, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to pick a two-dimensional lattice, and in this case, I'm picking a square lattice. Um, and when you see the pictures that I'm drawing, please don't. It's a lot easier to draw it on a square lattice. Um, then we pick our chiral chern simons theory, and, and just like I was explaining, the quantum numbers we put on the bonds are the quantum numbers from the chern simons theory. But also, the chern simons theory allows us to evaluate knots or loops. So we're going to, whenever we see a loop, we're going to use the same chiral chern simons theory to evaluate that loop, because you know, the whole idea of a topological quantum field theory is you see a knot and you can get a number out. So keep that in the back of our head. So now we're going to represent time. So we're going to do a sort of two plus one dimensional partition function picture of, the, of this story. So time is in the vertical direction. So here's our lattice duplicated many times in time. And now I'm just going to tell you, you know, if, if you're trying to make a space-time picture of what's going on, I have to tell you what quantum number is on each bond at each time. So how am I going to do that? Well, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to just draw a loop labeled with the quantum number n at this given time slice to indicate that this bond has quantum number n at this time. So what does this mean? Well, it means the wave function here um, has quantum number n. And then you see that the loop comes back up here. And that means the conjugate wave function has quantum number n bar at that time. That's how I want you to interpret this. So if you cut this diagram over here, just like I, I did before when I had that picture of a knot, if you cut the diagram at some point, you have the wave function here on the lower half and the conjugate wave function on the upper half. So I'm going to cut this, it tells me quantum number n is here and the conjugate wave function is up here, going the other way. Okay? Everyone happy with this? So here I haven't, I haven't done anything yet. I'm just telling you how to describe the system, you know, if, if I want to tell you <coughs> quantum number n at this time, quantum number m at this time, and so forth just giving you a way to, to draw that as a picture, okay? Everyone still happy? Speak now. Okay. So this is what the, um, so the picture looks like at one time slice. There's a bunch of loops sitting above, you know, above the lattice at, at any point in time. Each of these loops is labeled with, with a quantum number representing the quantum number of the lattice at that time. You're looking unhappy. Not unhappy? Okay. All right. Um, and then I have to do this at, at, at every time slice. So at this time slice, it will have one quantum number. This time slice, it might have another quantum number. This time slice, it has another quantum number. The pictures are going to get worse. So, um, okay. We don't need the, just, this is just to simplify the picture. We don't need that lattice. So we're just going to remember that each of these green loops represents a quantum number at each time. All right. Now remember that we're going to, we're going to try to do a, our, uh, a space-time partition function. So we're going to want to sum over all possible quantum numbers at all possible times. But remember that that omega thing that we, we cooked up before was a sum over all possible quantum numbers. So the way we're going to implement that sum over possible quantum numbers 
is by labeling each of these loops with omega. And that means sum over all possible quantum numbers of this loop. Okay? And there's a particular weighting that we've chosen, and that weighting has been chosen you know, for a reason. All right. So now we're going to build the Hamiltonian. And back here, I haven't, I haven't given you a Hamiltonian yet. I'm just telling you that how to, this picture means sum over all possible quantum numbers at all times. But now I actually have to give you a Hamiltonian. So if I start with a really simple Hamiltonian, say a Hamiltonian that's zero, Hamiltonians that are zero mean free propagation in time. Nothing changes from time to time. The Hamiltonian is you know, the generator of time evolution. So the Hamiltonian is zero. Nothing evolves. Um, so um, the quantum numbers should be conserved in time. So how do I show you that in the picture? Well, I can do that. I can insert a complete set to conserve quantum numbers in time by using one of these omega loops. What do I mean by that? Well, if I have a quantum number m at one time slice and n at the next time slice, if I wrap those up with an omega like this, that is actually insertion of a complete set. Because you'll remember that you can't stick anything <coughs> through that omega unless they both fuse to the vacuum. So that means m has to be n conjugate. So m and n go smoothly into each other like this. And so this is just one big m loop. Okay. So basically what I've do, I'm doing by taking that omega and wrapping it up like this is I'm inserting this complete set of states at this time slice. So it's transferring the quantum numbers up in time. Good? All right. So now my picture looks like this. It's, so these, um, these, loops are, these green loops are omega because I'm summing over all time slices, but these yellow loops are omega because I'm inserting a complete set. So that's actually going to going to force the quantum numbers to stay the same from time to time. All right, All right. now let's go to the, the real Hamiltonian. So the first term of the Hamiltonian is this vertex condition. The bonds coming into a vertex have to fuse to the identity. So we'll take our picture again. Let's look at one of the vertices. So at one of the ver vertices, there's these three of these green loops coming into one vertex. And we want them to fuse to the identity. Well, how do we force them to fuse to the identity? Well, we can do that. Again, by using the killing property of this omega, just wrapping up that loop with an omega. And then it kills everything unless those four bonds fuse to the identity. Everyone's still, still happy, still with me? Yes? So in general, if you have lots of these loops, there's more than one way to get into the Yeah, yeah, that's why we choose a, a trivalent. That's the, uh, in a trivalent lattice, there is isn't, at least for SU2 level K. That's why Levin and Wen chose. Um, otherwise, you need to specify. There's an additional variable in your Hilbert space that has to specify that. You basically have to point split down to try it. I mean, to be simple now. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's a, that's a subtle piece of strip, yeah. Um, actually, I should um, let me change that answer a little bit. The truth is that. In fact, the chain mail construction will work without even thinking about that. that where, where you get in trouble is you, when, you, when you try to translate chain mail construction back to a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian becomes more complicated, but the chain mail construction still looks the same. Because this, this will allow any fusion channel of those four particles as long as they all fuse to the identity. And that's right, and, you want to sum Yeah, and that, and that sum is, correct, is, is done correctly. So it actually doesn't matter in this, in this, in this case that we have a square lattice. So, it's, so this construction is a little bit more, more natural in that sense. But then when you, try to con to, when you try to work backwards to actually write the Hamiltonian, you have to look at the different fusion channels to specify it. But it comes out, it comes out correctly by itself in this case. OK, so, so we're going to now take these, we're going to put little omega loops, which I now draw in purple, um, on these vertices, on these, these sort of the, the vertical edges, such that um, I have this, instead of having free, free propagation from here to here, I have a, a vertex operator between psi and psi, and psi um, prime. Okay. Um, so now my, my lattice looks like this, getting more, more complicated. Um, and the last term of the Hamiltonian is this plaquette term. Well, um, the plaquette term is a little bit harder to explain, but remember that I told you that there was this, this duality between vertices and plaquettes. So you might think that something simple, like just a simple loop, is going to implement the plaquette operator. And in fact, that's true. 
Um, so remember that this, the yellow loops here, we're inserting a complete set between psi prime and psi. If I insert this little blue ring in the lattice like that, it changes the propagation from psi prime plaquette operator psi like that. So there you can see the little blue ring inserted. All right. So those are the parts of the Hamiltonian. And if you put the whole thing together, it looks like this. And, and it's, it's a little messy. But all of the, the loops that you see in this picture, and remember what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm actually constructing the, the physical partition function of the Levin-Wynn Hamiltonian. So if you evaluate this knot, you get the partition function of the Levin-Wynn Hamiltonian. Um, did I write that here? No, I didn't. Oh, there's a picture of it blown up, but let me back up to here for a second. Um, the, the loops, they're all omega loops, but I've colored them differently because they have different purposes. The green loop was a sum over all bond variables. The yellow loop was free propagation in the absence of a Hamiltonian, just an insertion of a complete set. The purple loops was this vertex projector, so all bonds coming into a vertex fused to the identity. And the blue loops turned the complete set, these yellow loops, into a plaquette projector. And you can sort of think of that as no flux going through a plaquette as compared to no quantum number allowed in the vertex. Okay, so this is what this thing looks like blown up. And you can kind of see that this, what I have here is a uh, cubic lattice. And every face of the cubic lattice has a loop running around it. And every edge of the lattice has a, has a loop running around it also. Can everyone sort of more or less see that? So, okay, what is it? If you evaluate this link, remember that there's a chern simons theory and that tells you how to evaluate a knot. This is a really complicated knot. If you evaluate this knot, what you get is the Trotter decomposition of the level one partition function, or at least the ground state sector of the level one partition function. Okay. So, any, any questions so far? Yes. You have to, is there a compact space or a Yeah, it has to be a compact space. Okay. Actually, it can be done on a, on a space with boundary also, but then the argument Um, so it turns out that this, this complicated knot is something that's been studied before. It's known as chain mail. Um, it was cooked up by um, Justin Roberts for a version of SU2 level K models, um, sort of in, in a simpler context. And it turns out to be related to a, an invariant of three manifolds, known as the Terea Varro states on invariant. Um, now, it was pointed out to me that a lot of people who are not necessarily native speakers of English, and some people who even are native speakers of English don't know what the word chain mail means. This is chain mail. It's a, it's a word for um, uh, you know, ancient armor, which is made by linking rings together. Um, mail is a general word for armor, and chain is obvious why it's called that. This is also how people dress at Oxford. Um, it's actually, it's, it's a, um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay, that was my one good joke. Um, so it's actually had a resurgence of uh, popularity in, in modern fashion, um, some of which I can't actually show you. If you're interested, um, you can Google it yourself and you'll be as shocked as I was. <laughs> so, anyway, so this chain mail invariant, or this Terea Varro state sum invariant, um, what is this thing? Well, remember, um, what this, so this is, I, I've written, this is the, the churn simons partition function. We have a manifold and we have this complicated chain mail link in the manifold. That's basically what the churn, chain mail invariant is. So you have a manifold, you break up this manifold into cells. You tile the cells in this way where each, um, let's see, do I have this picture? Yeah, so here's a plaquette of the cell, here's a cube of the cell, uh, sorry, here's a plaquette, here's a cubic cell, you break up the entire manifold into these little cubes. You put um, rings around each plaquette. You put rings around each edge. And you evaluate this complicated knot. You get the chain mail, the chain mail invariant. And it turns out that that equals the chern simons partition function, the vacuum partition function of the original manifold with nothing in it, times the vacuum partition function of the mirror image of the manifold. Okay, this should be rather surprising. There's a couple things that are surprising about this. One thing that's surprising is our chain simons theory is chiral. We put in one-handed theory, okay? And yet, when we evaluated this, this result is achiral. It's two copies with no chirality. Okay? Um, and that's, um, you know, it should be a little bit shocking, um, but is, is true, and I'll explain a little bit why that's true later. Um, and so the equivalence is that, um, 
Everyone's still happy with this so far? Anyone unhappy? Anyone very unhappy? Yes. What do you mean by mirror? Okay. Uh, mirror, I mean you take the same manifold and you reverse the chirality of it. So another way to do it is you can take the same manifold and reverse the chirality of the chern simons theory that you're, evalu you're evaluating. Those are so, Anything else? All right. Could you by only using half of your chain room just get one chirality? No. No, you can't. Uh, I mean, the way you would get one chirality is you evaluate the chern sinus partition function of the manifold with nothing in it. Okay, that's so yeah. easy. Yeah. So, all right. So here's um, one more identity that's sort of general to all these modular tensor categories of chain mail. Um, modular tensions categories or, or chern simons theories. Um, it's, it's, again, comes from just modularity of, of the theory. It's basically if I have a bunch of particles in my theory and I have an omega loop running around it, if another particle comes close to the omega loop, you can take it freely around the omega loop without changing the value of the knot invariant. Okay, this is known as handle slide for reasons that I will um, may explain to you later, um, if we have time. And, but it's really easy to derive. Um, at least in this incarnation. So this thing is equivalent to this thing because the, all the omegas have to fuse to the vacuum. This thing is equivalent to this thing because all the omegas, because the omega kills all these particles going through it and have to fuse to the vacuum. And then this and this are obviously the same because you only have to take the A over the vacuum. Okay? So it's, it's really just a, a result of the fact that omega projects the identity. Okay, but we're going to use handle slide a lot. Um, one thing you can do is you can use handle slide and killing to convince yourself that chainmail is independent of lattice geometry. Okay, so this is a, a picture of a chainmail decomposition. Um, so what I have here is th these little loops here are the, ch are the sort of the thin chainmail links. These longer thin loops are the chainmail links going around plaquettes, and the darker things are just guides to the eye. So so if this is some part of some triangulated manifold. You can sort of take these two omega loops, you can slide one over the other, that's just a handle slide move. Then this omega loop here is just going around two strings, this string and this string. So you can use the killing property on it, like that, and then you can pull these apart from each other. And you can end up convincing yourself just by doing handle slides and killing that you can re-triangulate the manifold and go from something that looks like this to something that looks like this freely without changing the value of the partition function. So it shows you very quickly that the, um, the partition function is it's just a topological invariant of the manifold. It doesn't depend on the details of how you triangulate it. Okay. okay. So now we want to actually, so all this stuff about chain mail is, I mean, the connection to Levin Wen wasn't maybe necessarily known, but, but stuff about chain mail and Torea Barreau and all this stuff was known ages ago by mathematicians. Um, but one thing mathematicians didn't consider is quasi-particles because you know, it just didn't appear in their, in their world. Um, what we want is we now want to consider violations of the vertex term or the plaquette term or both. So we need to have this partition <coughs> function in the presence of a violation. So how do we force a violation? Um, so you remember that if we have omega around a group, the killing property make, forces the group to fuse to the vacuum. Say I want to, instead of having the omega the, the group fuse to the vacuum, suppose I want to make a violation, I want the group to fuse to something other than the vacuum, say A, I can do that by just sticking another uh, line through that omega, and then the group now has to fuse to A so that it will cancel the A bar such that the whole thing will fuse to zero. Okay? So a quasi-particle world line really does look like a quasi-particle world line. So what do I mean by this? So if I take this, this is my chainmail link here. I've changed colors here a little bit. And I take an additional quasi-particle world line in blue, and I just stick it through these, you know, just right along this, this edge here. Instead of these edges now fusing to zero, they now, all the, all the physical quantum numbers, which are the green loops, the green loops carry the quantum numbers on the edge of the bonds. Instead of them fusing to zero when they go through here, they now have to fuse to A, because that A will then cancel the A bar which I just inserted by hand. Okay. Is that is that clear what I'm doing? Okay. So, um, so now I have a violation at this vertex, which moves up in time. So this is the quasi-particle world line of a, a quasi-particle quantum number a. Um, now, 
using this handle slide property, remember if A comes close to an omega, I can take the A around the omega for free. So here's a sketch of a chainmail link. So here are the plaquettes, here are the little the small links, here's my quasi-particle in blue. I can then do a handle slide over this plaquette, like that. So that's just moving the A around this plaquette. And I can pull it tight, and I see that I change the path of the quasi-particle. So this is free topological invariance that I can get, the, I can take the path of this quasi-particle, I can say handle slide it over this guy, like that, I can then handle slide it over this guy, like that, I can move him around freely, yes. Doesn't it matter that you have an omega loop around it in the beginning? You, I mean, you no. move it also through the yellow. It doesn't, because, um, let me back up further. The omega loop is one of these guys that wraps around. So it doesn't matter what, what's knotted with this omega. Because so anything going... Yeah, but I mean, the, the A is knotted by the omega. Uh, it is. It's touching the omega right here. So I can... No, so what I'm confused about is it's not only that you put it through the green loop, but instead of having it through one of the red loops, you have it through three of the That's red right. Loops. It changes the topology. That's right. I mean, it does change, it does change the topology, but that's, but that's the rule of the handle slide. The handle slide rule is it doesn't matter. So if you imagine, you know, so here the A can go over uh, this omega, even though there's a bunch of things coming through the omega the omega loop. So similarly here, if you think of the red guys, the red guys are coming through the omega loop, and yet I can go around, all the way around the omega loop. It That's doesn't right. matter what's, what's knotted through the omega loop, I can always go around it. But you seem to be removing something out of an omega loop. That's yeah, what the and moving into three other omega loops. No, so, so those other omega loops are these guys. So these guys, in fact I've drawn four of them in both cases. So one of them wraps around you know, over here, one of them wraps around over here, one of them wraps around over here, one of them wraps around over here. This A comes close, and then he can go around. And yes, it does go through the other things, but, but that's, the, that's the law of the handle slide, that you can, you can slide over those things. So these, these guys can be connected up somewhere else. So, so just take the simple case where, where there's just one of these loops and he closes back up over here. So this, this A, it started out not linked with this, and then after I handle slide, it is linked with this. That's how it works. So, is, that, is, it, is that at least clear what I'm, what I'm saying? So your, yes. your identity is the same no matter what the open link is. That's do. right. So no matter what these things, um, what, what these things do. And you can, you can prove it to yourself the way I, the way I told you, that they, really you're not going over anything. That the, the net total of the flux going through there is zero, so I can go through it. I can go over it. There's, actually, there's no flux threading through all four of those things, so I can go over it for free. Um, all right. So then you have this free handle slides like that. Okay. Now there's another type of uh, violation I can make. I can violate the... Non so in this picture... Uh, I'm violating the vertices, but I'm not violating any of these plaquettes. Now, you'll remember that I also have these plaquettes, these guys here, and I can choose to violate them too. So in this picture, I have, uh, I have a quasi-particle that violates the vertices, but then detours to violate the plaquette as well. So it's going through the middle of that plaquette. So it's now forcing um, this plaquette to no longer fuse to the identity, but rather to fuse to some quantum vertices. So this one, you know, similar, oops, okay, this is, so the rule for these, these, these things can handle slide around too, I can show you a movie of that later, it's sort of the same general principle, but the, the difference here is that these quasi-particles have to go through the plaquettes whenever they cross between cells. So, you know, you sort of belong to this cell, you go through, you cross to the next cell, so you have to go through the plaquette and so forth and so on. All right. So by handle sliding, you can show a couple of different things. These vertex particles, so I, ca I call these things mirror quasi-particles. So the vertex quasi-particles and the mirror quasi-particles are two independent sectors. You can show the vertex particles have the statistics of the original chern simons model, and the mirror particles have the opposite chirality. So let me start by showing the first thing. Okay, so here's a vertex string, 
and you know it's a vertex string because it's violating this vertex and it's violating this ver vertex. Okay, it doesn't cross to any of the plaquettes. This is a mirror string or plaquette string because it violates this vertex, but then it detours to violate this plaquette here, and then it goes back to violate this vertex, and then it violates the plaquette down here, and so forth. Does everyone, can everyone kind of see that? Yeah. yeah. What is the possibility that deviates from these two? I mean, there's, if yes. you just think of a string in this chain map, you can... Uh, you, could, you could do all sorts of things. You could imagine that. Okay, it turns out that many things that you try to do will, give this, will make the, zero, the partition function zero because it will end up corresponding to sort of a, um, I mean, you know it has to, because if you have a particle coming along that is of one particle type, and then you change, try to change this particle type into something else, that's not allowed in a, in a topological field theory. So you expect that it's gonna, that it will die, and it does. So many, many things that you try to do will die. The other thing that, um, that happens is sometimes you have something that you can, you can look at, but it ends up, ends up acting trivially on the Hilbert space you're concerned with, so it sort of decouples into some other mass that you're just not, that just doesn't do anything to the quantum numbers of your, of, of the actual physical system you're thinking about. So one of those two things always happens, and these are the only non-trivial things, and combinations of these are the only non-trivial things that happen. That's a good question. That's, that's actually hard to, to show at the end of the day. So, all right. So anyway, we have this vertex string going this way, we have the mirror string going this way, and then I can just try to slide one of these over the other. So let me try to slide over this plaquette like this, and then just move it on its way, and it just crossed right over with no problem. And that was, that was easy. Um, so the, that shows that they're, they're completely independent sectors. They don't braid with each other in any non-trivial way. Um, and you can, you know, if you're, if you're interested, I have movies of the vertex and the vertex trying to cross through each other and they get caught, or the mirror and the mirror trying to cross with each other and they get caught. So they, they break with themselves in a, in a non-trivial way. Um, okay, so how about this second statement? The vertex particles have the statistics of the original chern simons model that defines their link evaluation. So how do, you, how do you tell this? What do you know, how do you figure out what the statistics of these particles are? Well, one thing you can do is you can try to take this picture and by handle sliding, remove the quasi-particle from the chain mail link altogether until it's free, leaving behind just the vacuum chain mail and a knot, which you can evaluate by itself. So in this case, it's pretty easy if I have a simple loop like this. I do a, so I'm about to do a handle slide over this loop just from here. So now it looks like that. Did anyone see how that worked? Okay. And then I pull that tight, and you see it's just a free knot, a free open loop. So it didn't matter that it was on the on the chain mail in the first place. We can do a, a more complicated one. So this one is a, a trefoil that's been squashed down to a single plane, so I can draw it. Um, and you notice that <coughs> when I squash it down to a single plane, now you see these crossings, you have to keep track of over and under crossings. They can't cross through each other. So you have to keep track of those. And so it's this trefoil here, and then a bunch of handle slides. So quick motion there, handle slide there, handle slide there. I'm gonna do another handle slide here. Then pull that tight, keep going, another handle slide here, pull that tight, dun, 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 dun. and you're left with exactly the same trefoil, but now it's off the lattice. So that tells you that, that you really, these vertex particles don't even see the lattice at all. And there's a good reason for that, because they're not, there's no flux going through the lattice. They don't see the lattice at all underneath them. Okay? So that's maybe boring. Here's the interesting one. The mirror particles, I claim they have the opposite chirality from the original one. So for this, I have to kind of pull a rabbit out of my hat. Um, how on earth, in a right-handed churn sinus theory, how am I going to get left-handed particles? So here's the cool thing. Okay, so this is the knot I'm going to look at just as an example. I've drawn it in three dimensions here, but it's probably easier just to see it in two, two dimensions. It's, it's, it just looks like that. So here you can see it going around like this, it sort of goes under itself and goes on its way. You can tell it's a mirror particle because it goes through plaquettes whenever it crosses between cells. So here it goes through a plaquette, here it goes through a plaquette, here it goes through a plaquette, and so forth. Okay, that's the rule of the mirror particles. So drawing it a little bit more obviously projected um, down. Here it goes through a plaquette which isn't drawn, but it's sort of going under the other two. Here it goes over the other two. Here it goes over, here it goes over. So. 
that's the um, mirror quasi particle. So this is the knot we're looking at of the mirror quasi particles. Now a bunch of handle slides. So handle slide like this, pull it tight, and then there's a little bit of canceling of these twists, and at the end of the day, you're left with a knot that has the opposite chirality. So you switch the chirality of this twist by pulling it off the uh, pulling it off the scaffolding. So why is it this can happen? The reason this can happen is because in this case, you're handle sliding over plaquettes that you're actually linked with. So notice that this red line here is linked with this plaquette. It goes through, up through the plaquette and then out of the plaquette from the top. And then when you handle slide over something you're linked with, you can change your, your twist, your self-twisting. Okay? Now here's one that's a little harder to see. Uh, you know, I tried very hard to draw this, and I apologize, it's not great. But I'm going to show you how, if you have, so here's a, a quasi-particle going down through the scaffolding, and here's another quasi-particle that wraps around it. So this is the sort of simplified view. It goes in front, and then down, down the back. Now I'm going to pull this off the scaffolding, and I'm going to show that this knot gets, gets <coughs> ends up with the opposite chirality. So this is a little t tough to see, but it's, it's really the same moves over and over. So let's see. So first I'm going to handle slide over this plaquette here. Like that. And pull tight. Pull tight. Cancel the couple loops. Now I'm going to pull this thing over that handle, over this link here. And now you can kind of see what's, what's gone on here. Now three actually starts by coming behind one and then ends up coming in front of one. You have to pull, the, you know, in your head, you have to sort of pull the back forward to get to this. Um, and I can't actually do those handle slides because I didn't draw the appropriate plaquettes. But if you imagine pulling this back now forward, you see it's actually linked in the opposite way. So the summary is that the vertex quasi-particles, when they're on the scaffolding and when they're off the scaffolding, they have the same chirality. But the mirror quasi-particles, when you pull them off the, sca the scaffolding, they flip their chirality. Okay, that's how you get two-handed um, knots in the picture. Okay, so the summary of this is um, that if you have you have your chan simons partition function of a manifold with the chain metal link in the manifold. If there's, a, if there's a quasi particle running through the vertices, when you evaluate it, you get the same as the chan simons partition function, no chain mail, the quasi particle world line staying the same but living in the manifold, and then the mirror manifold is sort of left alone. Whereas if it's a mirror quasi particle, the quasi particle world line ends up in the mirror manifold. And the mirror and the, and the original manifold sort of don't speak to each other. All right, so why does this work? So this comes down to something that uh, Ed Witten sort of understood in his first paper, not surprisingly. Um, that there's this, so what is these omegas doing? If you have a churn time partition function of a manifold, and there's a link living in the manifold, and you join with that link an omega, an omega loop, that's the same as the churn time partition function of the same link without the omega in a new manifold, okay? And going from the, new ma from the old manifold to the new manifold, what you're doing is what's known as surgery, okay? So what's surgery? Surgery is the following procedure. You take this omega loop <coughs> and you thicken it a little bit to a torus, okay? You pull the torus out of the manifold, leaving a hole, okay? Now you want to return something to the manifold, which is going to close that up. Now one thing you could do is you could return the same torus to the manifold that you took out, in which case you get back what you started with. Another possibility is before returning that torus, you can switch the meridian and the longitude. What do I mean by that? So remember that a, a torus, um, a torus is, the torus surface is, is S1 cross S1, two circles, right? A solid torus is Fill in, one of the, fill in one of the circles and make it solid and leave the other one to circle, okay? So if I pull out of the manifold disk cross circle, I pull that out of the manifold, the surface I left behind is circle cross circle, okay? And I can decide to return to it circle cross disk instead of disk cross circle. Now you can't imagine this in three dimensions, so don't try, you'll go nuts. <laughs> but, um, but you can, topologically you can imagine doing this thing. It's, essentially equivalent to adding a handle to the three-dimensional manifold. Strictly speaking, you're adding the surface of a handle to the three-dimensional manifold. Okay. At any rate, this 
connection was known by was known by Whitman. As a matter of fact, much of his derivation of the of the in, in this Jones polynomial paper is actually done by arguing by a surgery. Okay. So what does this tell us? It tells us that if I have a link made entirely of omegas, for example, the chain mail living in a manifold, that's equivalent to the vacuum partition function of some other manifold, which is obtained by removing these omegas one at a time and doing surgery on each of them. So each time I, I, I get rid of the, one of these omegas, I pull out this torus, I replace it with a new twisted torus, and, and then I have the partition function of this new manifold without the omega. So you can think of this omega as an instruction for changing the manifold. Okay. So what is this new manifold? I removed all these omegas from this original manifold to get this new manifold. Vacuum partition function of some new manifold. It turns out that this new manifold is the original manifold connected to its mirror image. So this tells us that in fact what's going on here is, one, well once you have this, it's, it's, you're, you're really pretty much done. It tells you that the, the chain mail link is really instructions for changing this manifold into a new manifold, which is the original manifold connection to its mirror image. And then from here, it's very easy to show that the chain time is partition function and manifold connected to its mirror image is just the product of the two partition functions. Um, so the moral of this story is that the mirror world here is real. And these omega loops, or on the one hand, you can think of them as defining your you know, leaven land partition function. On the other hand, you can think of them as instructions for constructing a new manifold by doing surgery. And when you do construct that a new manifold by surgery, you realize that you've constructed a chiral manifold with both chiralities. In fact, once if you start thinking about quasi-particle world lines, all you have to do, do I have to come, yeah, if they're quasi-particle world lines, all you have to do is, you know, you, you have the quasi-particle world line sitting in your manifold, you do surgery on this manifold. You're left with a chain, you know, you'll be left with, you know, after you do all these surgeries, you're left with quasi-particle world lines living in M connected to M bar. And all you have to do is ask yourself, are these quasi-particle world lines in M or are they in M bar? Or something more complicated, do they go between the two? But what happens is, in fact, if, you, if they're vertex quasi-particles, they end up in M. If they're these mirror quasi-particles, they end up in M bar. This can be shown by various topological nonsense. And everything works out the way you would hope it. Okay, so this is sort of a, uh, since I'm running out of time, this is sort of a collection of sort of what we've understood by doing this, um, but, but this is not why we started doing the project. The reason we started doing the project is because we were really interested in um, three plus one dimensions. It turns out that in three plus one dimensions, four dimensions, there's, there's an analog of the Ture of Rho invariant known as crane which can also be described in terms of chainmail. And we thought, well, you know, if we can make this interpretation of two, two plus one dimensional topological models in terms of chain mail, can we work backwards from crane Yetter to get a topological model in three plus one dimensions? Um, because very little is actually known about topological models in, in three plus one dimensions. Um, unfortunately, as a topological invariant, this crane Yetter invariant is almost trivial. It's sensitive only to the signature of the four manifold, um, which is kind of like a bunch of parodies. Um, however, if the four manifold has a boundary, then, in fact, you recover the chain simons partition function of the boundary of the four-manifold. Four so what is this? This is, this is like a non-trivial topological insulator. So um, you know, one of the, the sort of outstanding problems is how do you come up with a lattice model of a chiral chain simons theory? Uh, a, to, uh, a lattice model, is there an analog of Lenin and Wen that will give you a chiral chain simons theory? And there's actually arguments why you can't do it. You know, there's sort of no-go theorems about why you will always get two chiralities no matter what you do. Um, but if you sort of the same way you have the topological insulators or the fermion doubling problem, if you start with a four-dimensional manifold and you look at the surfaces, you can actually separate the two chiralities from each other. And focusing on one surface, you can get just the, the chiral version of the, of the model. So it's, it looks very much like these topological insulators, but it can be uh, much more complicated topological trivial uh, topological insulator because it's you know, it's a full chain Simons theory instead of just some trivial um, fermion theory. Um, all right, uh, let me just stop there. Take any further questions. Uh, I can show you more movies if you want to see them. Yeah, and thanks for your attention. <laughs>
All right, one, one more important thing. If people are interested, the way you make these diagrams is with this program called POV Ray, which is a fantastic program for making pictures in four dimensions. It's open source. You can download it for free. It's really easy to learn. It's like using LaTeX. You know, you write these little codes and it, and it compiles them. It's really great. So. Could you write it down? POV, yeah. Just Google it. Questions. Questions. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so people consider adding the strength tension term to the 11 mm model. I'm trying to help you to figure it out. Can you follow something like that in your representation? Um, you know, anything that you could imagine doing, we could imagine trying to attack too. At the, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the things. You know, it ends up being no easier, no more difficult when you really get down to doing the grungy calculations. The, I think the, the big advantage of thinking this term is you, is you have pictures that are easy to, to, to work through. And sometimes, you know, something that would take you a lot of tensor algebra at 11 and when, after you've done the tensor algebra, you would say, oh yeah, I could have, I could have just made this, this move, whatever. And it becomes very obvious in this, in this language. So I don't think that, that we're going to actually gain anything from that. Perspective. Actually, one thing that we may gain, and we, oh, Yost isn't here today, right? Um, is, oh, and you missed Yost's talk yesterday, so you'll have to, never mind, let me tell you. So I think um, in some of this topological symmetry breaking stuff, some of the things that, that Yost was thinking about actually might come, come out much more naturally in this language, basically because the two chiralities um, have to talk to each other once you do topological symmetry breaking. And if you start with two unconnected theories, it's hard to see how you're going to get the two chiralities to talk to each other. And in this picture, actually, it looks like it's, it's pretty easy to force them to talk to each other. So I think in this picture, there might be something. I mean, at the end of the day, again, once you really get down to doing the nitty-gritty calculation, it's all going to be the same grungy F matrix mass. But, but many of the, same, the, the things that you, you know, should be able to tell trivially, you, you can't just see by looking at it unless you're really very familiar with Levin and Wen, where you can just see it very trivially. So it's not really much of an answer, I guess. But other questions? Comments? Well, I have got a question. I sort of lost track how much of the modularity you're actually using. Not an awful yeah. lot. Do you need it? Or yeah. Uh, so you have these, you, you use this for this omega, but you there need, you just, you, you need really don't need it. You need killing. You need, you need I mean, you the modularity. You need a certain omega loop just with quantum dimensions, which you have. Yeah, but it, but it doesn't. I mean, it's it's the unitarity of the F of the you S matrix. You're actually using the unitarity. Yeah, because that, that's what that's what gives you the killing property. That, I mean, because basically, you um, you know, by by take by summing these quantum dimensions, you multiply. You're basically multiplying by the first row of the S matrix, and you need that to be that to. The unitarity means that you're only going to get something non-zero if whatever's going through oh, okay. is 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 the vacuum. So it has to it has to be unitary. I mean, in these these things that in these models that are almost unitary, like um, like you know, fermionic readers I or something like that, there may be some way to mod out the fermion and, and make it still work. Um, but if it was if it was very non-unitary, I, I don't even know any, any examples of things where to play with that are very non-unitary. Um, but other questions, comments, people are completely baffled. Like just start from the beginning and <laughs> <laughs> All right. well, if not that thanks